Hello, I'm Susan Woods of Susan Woods Nonprofit Solutions. I'm continuing with the tutorial, starting nonprofits, step number 15. Step number 15 has several parts to it. So we are now talking about part five of step 15, which is the compensation and other financial arrangements. If you recall, step 15 is when we started completing the Form 1023 application for recognition of exemption, the actual application. And that application has different parts to it. So we are on part five of the Form 1023 application for recognition of exemption. And this part is called compensation and other financial arrangements. So again, we are on step 15, part five, of completing the Form 1023. The Form 1023 application for recognition of exemption is the official application used to apply for 501c3 status from the IRS. The Form 1023 is the long version of the application that requires the completion of all of the documents, which are called supplemental responses you've learned to complete. The Form 1023 includes 10 parts and eight schedules. It allows you to really explain the community services you plan to provide through a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Now I complete the full version. This is the full long standard version of the application. There is a Form 1023 EZ. I don't complete that Form 1023 because it only requires you to attest to completing all of the supplemental responses or all of the documents that you attached to the long version. Instead, I complete the Form 1023 long version for my clients because I want the IRS exemption specialist that's assigned to, to review their application packet. I want them to be required to read and approve all of the documents so that there won't be any doubt about whether or not they understand what the vision is and what the desire to start a nonprofit organization is based upon. If you are only attesting, attesting to the fact that you have done these documents, then they don't ever have a chance to read them. So now you are basing your application packet on assumptions. And I don't do that for my clients. So that's why I complete the full version. Now, the Form 1023 application for recognition of exemption has 10 parts, as I stated before. And I've listed the parts here, one through 10. And I've also listed the information required in each part or the titles of each part. So we are going to focus on the compensation and other financial arrangements, which is part five in this video message. So I'm going to demonstrate to you while I am actually in the application, I'm going to demonstrate how to complete the part five compensation and other financial arrangements of the form 1023 application for recognition of exemption. So let me pause the sharing so that I can actually pull up that screen that I need to demonstrate for you. I think it's important to demonstrate because I want you to be able to um, see what you should do when you start completing your own application. So I am going to show you the screen and walk you through the steps to completing part five of the Form 1023. Now, if you've been following along with these videos um, that walk you through the steps to completing your application packet to earn 501c3 status, you know that we are in the pay.gov, or we are on rather the pay.gov website because that's where you have to go to complete the Form 1023 application for recognition of exemption. Effective January 1st, 2020, the IRS transitioned to this online platform to submit the application packet to earn 501c3 status. 
So this is where I am and I'm already on part five of the form 1023. So as you can see, I'm on part five and I'm already, um, this is the application for recognition of exemption under section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code continued. So part five is compensation and other financial arrangements. And I'm gonna increase the size of the screen so that you can see a little bit better. How about that? Okay, so now we're just gonna ask answer a few questions in this section. And it says, do you or will you compensate officers, directors, or trustees? Or do you or will you have highest compensated employees or highest compensated independent contractors? If no, continue to line two. Let's first look at this because this question is a loaded question. First of all, when you say officers, directors, or trustees, you're talking about your you are talking about your board of directors. Some people call people who participate on the board as officers. Some people call people who participate on a board as directors. Some people call people who participate on a board as trustees. Okay. Some people even call people who participate on a board as members. But this references a board of directors. So this question asks, do you or will you in the future compensate officers, directors, or trustees? Okay, so you have to answer that question according to what you plan to do with your organization. Most board of directors are not paid. Most people who participate on the board of directors are not compensated. So the second part of this question, are do you or will you have highest compensated employees or highest compensated independent contractors? Now, employees, of course, are people who work for your organization, your nonprofit organization, performing whatever responsibilities their job description dictate, dictates. Then you have compensated independent contractors are those people who will come in and do something for your nonprofit organization on a temporary basis they are not considered compensated employees. So you set them up as independent contractors. So the question is, are you going to con compensate them? Either group, compensated employees or compensated independent contractors. Now this question, I wish the IRS would revise because it's misleading. Because if you say, yes, you know, of course I'm gonna have compensated employees on my team, and most nonprofit organizations will say yes, because that makes sense. Or yes, we have to pay independent contractors. But the question is, or the problem is the amount. You see, you only answer yes if you are planning to compensate employees or independent contract, contractors in excess of $100,000. How do I know that? I click on the, the uh, question mark here. Check yes if you do or you will compensate your officers, directors, or trustees. Also, check yes if you do or you will have highest compensated employees or highest compensated independent contractors. For purposes of this form, this is important now, highest compensated employees or independent contractors are persons to whom you pay over, over $100,000 of reportable compensation, including compensation from related organizations. For information on determining if an individual is an employee or an independent contractor, see publication 15A, Employer Supp Supplemental Tax Guide. This is serious. And like I said, I wish they would have put this caveat in the actual question because more than likely people are gonna just click on yes and not read the question, not read the additional information that's under the question mark, right? So in this case, my client is not gonna pay anyone over $100,000. So we could click on no. And so some of my clients are like, wait a minute, why did you click on no, we're gonna pay people? I said, but you didn't click on the question mark. You didn't read the caveat you're not paying anybody over $100,000. So we're gonna click on no. 
that question should be rewritten again with that caveat in the question to reduce confusion. But if you're not paying anybody over $100,000, you click on no, and you are still able to pay them whatever you plan to pay them that's less than $100,000. You're not going to get in trouble for clicking on no here. You're answering no because you're saying you're not going to pay anybody over $100,000. Have to be very careful. So we're going to go on to number two. Have you adopted a conflict of interest policy consistent with the sample conflict of interest policy in Appendix A to the instructions? And the answer is yes. You have adopted a conflict of interest policy. Okay. Do you or will you compensate any of your officers, directors, trustees, highest compensated employees, and highest compensated independent contractors through non fixed payments? such as discretionary bonuses or revenue-based payments. Now, again, this is something to be very careful about because we have some nonprofit organizations that do want to pay people based on an incentive plan, some type of non-fixed payment, not a, the same amount of um, income each month. It's based on commission or based on bonuses, depending upon what they do to earn those things. So if you plan to do that, you have to describe all non-fixed compensation arrangements, including how the amounts are determined, who is eligible for such arrangements, whether you place a limitation on total compensation, and how you determine or will determine that you pay no more than reasonable compensation for services. Now, reasonable. Reasonable compensation is a phrase that the IRS uses quite frequently to make sure that you are not using your nonprofit organization in an, in an extravagant way. You're not paying people unreasonable compensation. So when you are basing things on bonuses or, or certain things that they can do to earn more money, you may run into some problems with the IRS. So, but again, this is your application. If you plan to provide bonuses to people for whatever reason, then you have to click on yes. So let's click on the question mark here to get some more clarity around this. A fixed payment means a payment that is either a set dollar amount or fixed through a specific formula where the amount doesn't depend on discretion. For example, a base salary of $200,000 that is adjusted annually based on the increase in the consumer price index is a fixed payment. A non-fixed payment means a payment that depends on discretion. For example, a bonus of, a bonus of up to $100,000 that is based on an evaluation of performance by the governing board is a non-fixed payment because the governing body has discretion over whether the bonus is paid and the amount of the bonus. So just bear in mind uh, what your nonprofit organization is going to do when you answer this question. But most of my clients answer no on this question. And then next, do you or will you purchase or sell any goods, services, or assets from or to any of your officers, directors, or trustees? Any family of any of your officers, directors, or trustees? Any organizations in which, in which any of your officers or directors or trustees are also officers, directors, or trustees, or in which any individual officer or trustee owns more than 35% interest. Your highest compensated employees, your highest compensated independent contractors. So are you planning to purchase or sell any goods, services, or assets from or to? any of those individuals. And you meaning not you personally, but the organization, your nonprofit organization. So you want to be careful about answering this question. And I advise you to click on the question mark to read more about it. Okay, just go through and read this information because it gives more details around how you should answer that question. Now, if you do answer yes, describe any such transactions that you made or intend to make 
with whom you make or will make such transactions, how the terms are or will be negotiated at arm's length, and how you determine you pay no more than fair market value or you are paid at least fair market value. Most of my clients click no for this question. But you, again, this is your application, so you have to answer accordingly. So we are done with part five, compensation and other financial arrangements of the Form 1023 application for recognition of exemption under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code. So we can click on continue. Oh, I'm sorry, we're not done. Excuse me, thought we were <laughs> I thought we were done. Okay, a little bit more, a little bit more information under part five. Part five, question five or line five. Do you or will you have any leases, contracts, loans or other agreements with the people that I listed before? And again, what the IRS is trying to do in answer, asking these questions and requiring that you document your answers in writing is they're trying to make sure that you don't have any conflict of interest because all of these questions pertain or fall under the umbrella of conflict of interest. So they're just trying to make absolutely sure that you don't have any conflict of interest. So I'm gonna click on no, because you know what to do. If you have any need for clarification, you just click on the question mark here and you make a decision or you answer your question based on what your organization is doing or will do. Do you or will you contract with another organization to develop, build, market, or finance your facilities? If yes, describe each facility, the role of the other organization, and any business or family relationship between the organization and your what? Officers, directors, or trustees. Explain how that entity is selected, how the terms of any contract are negotiated at arm's length, and how you determine you will pay no more than fair market value for services. Once again, if this pertains to you, then you know what to do. You answer yes. Now, let's dig a little bit deeper and see what develop really means. When they say, are you going to have someone develop your facilities? Develop means the planning, financing, construction, and provision of similar services involved in the acquisition of real property, such as land or a building. For example, you should provide information regarding the services of a consultant who arranges your acquisition of a nursing home through the issuance of tax exempt bonds. Now, if none of that pertains to you, then you know what to do. You know to just simply click on no. I'm sorry, I clicked on the one wrong no. I'll go back to, I double check on this. Okay, so now the next one. Does or will someone other than your own employees or volunteers manage your activities or facilities? I'm going to say no on that, but you can certainly click on the question mark to determine whether or not that's true for you. Because manage means to direct or administer. For example, you would provide information about an organization hired to administer a museum gift shop, for example. Now, the next question on line eight of part five. Do you participate in any joint ventures, including partnerships or limited liability companies treated as partnerships in which you share profits and losses with partners? If yes, state your ownership percentage in each joint venture, list your investment in each joint venture, describe the tax status of other participants in each joint venture, including whether they are 501c3 organizations, Describe the activities of each joint venture. Describe how you exercise control over the activities of each joint venture. And describe how each joint venture furthers your exempt purposes. That's a lot, right? So again, if you have questions about it, just read the information here to learn more about it and answer accordingly. But most clients I work with answer no here. So now I think we are done with part five. Um, under compensation and other financial arrangements. So I'm going to click continue. And now we are on part six where I'm going to stop here because I only wanted to talk about part five. So I'm going to pause the screen so that I can go back to the PowerPoint and wrap everything up. 
I hope these exercises are helpful for you and um, help you walk through the process of completing a 501c3 application packet for yourself. Okay, so now I'm back again, and these again are the parts to the Form 1023 Application for Recognition of Exemption. These are the parts, and we are on part five, compensation and other financial arrangements. In addition to the parts, as I mentioned before, the Form 1023 Application for Recognition of Exemption includes schedules as well. So there are schedules that you complete as well. And those schedules are only completed if you meet these criteria, if you have these purposes. For example, if you are starting a church, then you will complete the schedule A. If you start, if you're starting a nonprofit school, then you will complete the schedule B, so on and so forth, as you can see here. I'll just leave it up for just a few moments so you can read the different categories of schedules and so that you can determine whether or not you are going to need to complete this schedule. And it's in addition to the documents that you would normally submit with the Form 1023 Application for Recognition of Exemption. The most popular schedule that I complete for clients is Schedule H because a lot of clients want to provide scholarships and loans and grants to individuals. So I do complete the Schedule H pretty frequently for my clients. Okay, well, we're at the end of this lesson. Again, I'm Susan Woods. I started my own 501c3 nonprofit organization in 2006. I offer two programs over a 10 year period. I'm not offering any programs underneath my nonprofit right now because of the time constraints that I'm faced with. However, I do keep my status active by submitting my form 990 information return every year because I don't wanna lose my status. I don't want the IRS to revoke my status. So in order to prevent the IRS from revoking your status, you want to complete the appropriate form 990 information return every single year, even if you generate zero revenues because I'm, I'm not generating any revenues because I'm not offering any services but I still complete my Form 990 NE postcard every year to keep my status active. I earn three nonprofit management certificates. I earn one from Wake Forest University, Duke University, and Winthrop University. I'm also a three-time graduate of Winthrop University in Rock Hill, South Carolina. I earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration, a Master of Arts in Teaching Business Education, and a Master of Business Administration degree. I teach in-person classes and I also teach online classes. I offer self-paced independent learning online as well. And finally, I complete the Form 1023 application for recognition of exemption for clients across the United States. As of the taping of this video, I've completed 160 application packets since 2010 and I do have a 100% approval rating from the IRS. To learn more about me, just visit trustsusanwoods.com. Thank you so much for taking time from your busy schedule to look at this video message. I hope that you've learned how to complete part five of the Form 1023 Application for Recognition of Exemption successfully. This is the Starting Nonprofits tutorial. And if you would like to talk with me about uh, giving me the opportunity to complete your 501c3 application packet for you, just go to my website at www.trustsusanwoods and click on reserve consultation and reserve a time in which we can talk about your nonprofit vision and how I can help you realize the vision. Thank you again, I'm Susan Woods. I really appreciate your time. Have a great day.